All right, this is just a really quick overview of what you need to know about genetic engineering for the test that we're going to take next week on it. Um, so first, restriction enzymes. You need to know what they are. What they are are um, enzymes that bacteria have that cut DNA at specific sites. Whenever they encounter a site with a particular code, they're going to chop that DNA, make a cut in it. The bacteria have the enzymes themselves, that it protects them from being infected by viruses. Um, they protect their own DNA by putting little methyl groups on their DNA. So we've taken these DNA and we use them so that we can either A, cut DNA to do a DNA fingerprint, because everybody's DNA is going to be cut a little differently, depending on how many recognition sites and where the recognition sites are for that enzyme. We can also use it to splice together DNA, um, like in this picture. So in this case, this enzyme cuts at a palindromic sequence, meaning when we read it from five to three in one direction, five to three, we have G, A, A, T, T, C. Now technically that's not a palindrome. If you were to look at that backwards, it doesn't spell the same thing, because a palindrome would be like a word like race car. No matter which way you read it, it's the same word. However, in DNA, since DNA only is read five to three, if we look at the other side of this particular strand and we read it also five to three in the other direction, it's G, A, A, T, T, C. So we do have a palindrome. What will happen is when this enzyme cuts, it will specifically cut at that particular sequence every time it finds that sequence and only that sequence. And it's gonna create what are called sticky ends. In other words, if we can find anything we want, any other DNA we want, as long as that DNA ends with TTAA over here and AATT over here, they'll be attracted to each other and we can splice this and put any gene we want into this particular DNA segment. Um, I think this is just a step-by-step -step showing the same thing. There's the recognition site, we get fragments, Here's a DNA we want to stick in there, cut with the same enzyme, and the segments match. And then we use DNA ligase, which we've learned about before, as a glue to seal those together. All right, now the thing is, if we want to create um, a DNA, a transgenic DNA, it's usually not going to work if we use a humongous piece of DNA. For example, um, we in the lab created bacteria that glowed because they had a gene, a plasmid, that they picked up from their environment that contained a gene from a jellyfish. And then they could make this protein that made them glow. The thing is, I can't get a bacteria to absorb a giant piece of DNA. What I can do, though, is get a bacteria to absorb a small piece of DNA. And bacteria naturally have these small pieces of DNA. That's their plasmids. Plasmids typically carry things like antibiotic resistance genes. And so what we can do is we can open up a plasmid, put in the DNA we want, and then get the bacteria to take the plasmid back in again. And this is called a recombinant plasmid. In other words, we've recombined the DNA. And we can then put it into our bacteria, deliver that DNA into another cell. We can actually uh, create viruses that insert the DNA. We can create bacteria that insert that DNA. Um, but this is how we created our glowing bacteria. Here's a little uh, visual of the same thing. We cut up both the DNA and the plasmid with the same enzyme, mix them in a tube, and we're going to get um, plasmids fused together. Some of these actually will not be working plasmids because if the ends are sticky, you could have some of these purple ones that just seal back together, or some of these blue ones that just seal together or seal with other blue ones. But once we put these in a bacteria, we can screen these bacteria and find out which of these bacteria picked up the plasmid we're interested in. And then from there, we can purify it. Which brings us to, um, here's another diagram showing the same thing. Here's the thing, you need to understand this process and how it works, and you need to understand how we would then turn around and screen this, which is this last step here. In other words, if we create a plasmid that's gonna give our, our bacteria some kind of a new property. If we're interested in just the bacteria that got transformed, we need to find a way to screen them so that only the bacteria we're interested in are the ones that'll grow. So what we did in the classroom is we got the bacteria to pick up the plasmids. In order for a bacteria to pick up a plasmid, 
it has to be what's called competent. Competent just means that it's ready to absorb it, that the cell walls are weak. Some bacteria are competent in nature. The ones we were using, E. coli, are not competent naturally. So we used a method called heat shock. We basically put them on ice, then we put them in a hot water bath, we put them back on ice, and we expose them to a chemical called calcium chloride during this whole process, and that basically disrupted their cell walls enough that they would pick up the plasmid and then we would get colonies of bacteria. In other words, every time a single bacteria survives in our little Petri dish, that bacteria makes thousands of clones, thousands of copies by binary fission. And then what we end up with are things that look like, what they're called colonies. And each of those came from an original single surviving bacteria. All right, how do we screen these? So like I said, we only want the ones to grow that picked up our plasmid. There's a lot of ways we can do this. We use antibiotic resistance. In other words, we use a plasmid. This was our plasmid. It contained our gene. This was our jellyfish gene. And this gene allowed them to glow. But we picked a plasmid that also happened to have another gene on it. And the gene that happened to be on it was an ampicillin resistance gene. So when we went to grow our bacteria, we basically put them in a Petri dish and in that petri dish, we included the antibiotic ampicillin. Any bacteria that picked up our plasmid would have the gene that protected them from being killed. Any bacteria that did not pick up our plasmid would be killed. If they therefore grew, we would know that they had picked up our gene to glow because the two genes had been linked together on one plasmid. A second thing we can use is a gene that makes the colony a different color. In other words, imagine instead of the gene being for ampicillin resistance, instead we use a gene on our plasmid that makes the bacteria grow blue. Then any bacteria that picked up our plasmid, everything will grow, I should say. Every bacteria will grow. There won't be any that are killed, but the ones that picked up our plasmid, the colonies will be a different color. And therefore, we want to extract them, we'll know exactly which ones have picked up our plasmid. A third way we can do this is we can allow them, we can include a plasmid that lets them digest something that they can't normally digest. So for example, we could include a gene, the LAC gene, which lets them digest lactose. Then what we could do is put them on a plate where the only food available for them is lactose. The only bacteria that are gonna grow are gonna be the ones that have picked up our plasmid because they will have the ability to now digest lactose in addition to the ability to glow. So this is, these are ways that we can screen our bacteria to make sure that only the ones we want are gonna be the ones that grow. Okay, um, another thing that we can do these days is we can actually make DNA from RNA. All you have to know about this is that the enzyme that's used is called reverse transcription, or reverse transcriptase, sorry. Transcription is where DNA is copied to mRNA. Reverse transcriptase does the opposite. It allows DNA to be made from mRNA. So we can even get an mRNA sample, and then we can figure out what the DNA code was because we can work backwards. Um, okay, the rest of these things here just be able to give some kind of an example of an engineered protein. So for example, we know that we can make bacteria that make human insulin, that make blood clotting factors that are involved in, for example, people with hemophilia, um, interferon, which has to do with uh, the immune response. Uh, we can make vaccines by purposely putting genetically engineered plasmids in that will stimulate the immune system in a particular way. We can make plants with all kinds of things. Any kind of an example is fine. Again, um, cotton plants that are resistant to herbicides, um, aspen plants that make more cellulose. In other words, they make more for when we want to get uh, trees that make paper, we can make them more efficient at making paper. Um, this was tobacco plants that make a human protein, mustard plants that produce biodegradable plastics, uh, and then there's mammals. We've got um, lots of examples here too. We've got mice uh, that had a hormone deficiency. We put a rat gene into them and um, that got put into their DNA and here's our engineered mice that are much bigger than the ones that had the dwarfism, which is sort of the idea of gene therapy, putting in a corrected gene 
to replace a gene that's not working. We've also put GFP, a glowing gene, into mice. We can use this to track, for example, the progress of cancer, to look at where genes from organ transplants grow, um, go, et cetera. Uh, we saw a little video on featherless chickens. They're actually not genetically engineered. They're, the, they're from artificial um, selection where they basically found chickens that had the right characteristics and selectively bred them. The next thing you need to know is how to do an gel electrophoresis. Um, you have a reading on this from the rainbow electrophoresis, but really quick, DNA is negative because it has phosphates and phosphates are negative. We put our DNA at the negative end because opposites attract. So if you put it at the negative side of the gel, when we plug this into electricity, the DNA is gonna travel towards the positive end. We then apply a current, our DNA is going to start moving towards the positive end. However, the longer the piece, the more base pairs it has, or the bigger the piece, it's going to travel more slowly because it's got to pass through in between the little pores of the gel. And so what we're going to end up with is a DNA fingerprint, which is going to be unique. This is a sample of an electrophoresis. Um, I just got this one online. They're showing you blood from a crime scene. These are all the bands. Most likely it started down here and traveled this direction. And we can see that person number three is the only one that matches the crime scene. So this is just a very simple way of DNA fingerprinting. Um, how do we analyze these? We, can, we have to stain the DNA in some way. In our class, we're using a, a probe that's going to make them glow under UV light. There's different kinds of stains you can use. Um, and we look at the pattern of the bands. We can use this, number one, for criminal suspects. Number two, we can also use it if we found a body and the body was not distinguishable, they didn't have it, you know, it was decomposed or whatever. Um, and we can also use this for paternity testing. Now for paternity testing, the DNA is not gonna be identical. In paternity testing, the DNA came from the mom, half of it, and the dad, the other half. So when we look at the DNA of a child, they're gonna have about 50% of their DNA in common with their father, not all their DNA. So analyzing a, a familial relationship is going to be a little bit different. Um, amplifying DNA. We can make lots of copies of DNA. All you really need to know about that is that it's called PCR. That's the name of the technique. It basically involves taking a very small piece of DNA and you use a special enzyme called TAC polymerase, which is from hot springs bacteria. And what they do is they add this enzyme and then they heat it up and that activates the enzyme, and then they cool it back down. And what that's gonna do is every cycle, it's gonna make one copy of that little DNA segment that they want to copy. And so if they let this run for 24 hours, you're gonna have a million copies of the DNA. All right, how to calculate um, the chances of you being at a particular crime scene. What they would do is they would look at uh, different sites. And they might say, for example, let's say that I'm big A little a for a particular, a particular site and 10% of the population is big A little a. And then let's say that I'm also big B little b and 50% of the population is big B little b and I'm big C big C and 20% of the population is big C big C. Then the chances of somebody having the exact same code as me would be 0 0.10, in other words 10%, times 0 0.5, 50%, times 0.2, 20%, and that would mean that about 1% of the population would have those three genes in common with me. In a lab, what they're gonna do is test 20 or more sites so that the chances of you being the person at the crime scene, it pretty much eliminates so many people that it's one in two billion or something like that, and that's enough to stand up in court. All right, and the last thing here, DNA chips. Um, just know what a DNA chip is. Basically, the idea is, here's a picture of one, the idea is that if you, they have hundreds, hundreds of genes on here. If you're big R, big R, that gene's going to glow green. If you're little R, little R, it's red. If you're big R, little R, it's yellow. And so what would happen is they would do like this DNA wash and you would get a little tiny chip. Imagine this being on your driver's license eventually. And that little chip would basically be your DNA fingerprint for you know, for these 2,000 genes. And you could just scan this instead of a social security number, instead of anything else, this would be your fingerprint. You just run it through a scanner and, and yours would be different and unique from everybody else's. So that's sort of the general uh, idea of what you need from these notes.
or the text.